we are asking people to stop their video uh, and uh, then we'll, uh, we'll, but we'll do that right after we call the roll. So what we need to do is, is uh, let it hit 530 and then we'll call the roll. And then I'll just ask you to do that uh, right after Ann finishes her, her stuff, okay? You got it. Hey, Reed. Yeah. Nice report today. Oh, it was a long day. It's supposed to be three hours and it was uh, for four and a half. But now we get to do this. Let's, um, okay, it's 5.30. So, uh, uh, Adrian, if you would go ahead and turn on your, turn on your uh, video and, uh, or I guess Ann's got to call the roll to do her stuff and then I'll hey, I'll call on Adrian and then we'll turn it back to Ann. Ann, call the roll. Yes, sir. Reed. Here. Eloisa. Here. Al. I'm here. Anita. I think Anita won't be here. She told me she would not be here. Uh, Anthony. Uh, Andy? Here. Anne Marie? Here. Curtis? Here. Dana? I'm here. Dee Dee? Here. Jack? I'm here. Jim? I'm here. John? I'm here. Michael Kinnick? I'm here. No? Okay. Did you hear me? Now I can. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Michael Kinnick is here. Thank you. Okay. Michael Sanchez? Here. Norman? Dr. Femi? I'm here. Peter. Here. Seymour. And Wayne. So I think I saw that Anthony Edwards, are you here? No, okay. And then Andy Castillo. And I got, I got 14, we got a quorum. So okay. go ahead, what's next? Okay, uh, the next is the invocation. So uh, we come before you today to give you honor and praise. Thank you for every gift that we have been given. We thank you for the opportunity to come and gather today. We ask for your hand of blessing on this meeting of the CPS Energy Rack. We ask that you would guide and direct our meeting so that it is full of wisdom, productivity, and respect for one another. Thank you for helping us to accomplish our work and our goals this day. Amen. Okay, Adrian, why don't you go over those um, protocols for us and, and why we're doing a couple things. Go ahead. Yes, Reed. Uh, first off, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, thank you, Reed, for introducing me. Uh, one, the first thing I want to get with is uh, the chat box. So displayed uh, on your screen, uh, on the bottom right hand side, you should see uh, two buttons, participants and chat. And so as Reed mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, uh, we want to make sure that you are in a queue if you do have a question to ask. And so basically you would just hit on that, uh, that chat box and then it'll pop up the chat box there. And at the bottom right hand, you can enter your chat message here. So I'm just going to do a quick test here just to show everyone an example. And put hello here. And that'll send, that'll send basically everyone here uh, a message there that you either want to ask a question or you have something to say. And so that will prompt myself and uh, Kennard, who you just heard, and also read to know that you want to speak or ask a question. 
or you have something to say. Uh, so that way it's easily for us to track on the chat box that you have, um, you're in order of who wants to speak and so on and so forth. Um, so if you do have a question about that, um, you're more than welcome to ask it also in the chat box or you can uh, uh, address it here right now. And so the second thing that we want to address is also uh, the bandwidth. And so to limit the bandwidth, um, not for my, my end, but just for other folks that may have bandwidth issues, uh, we ask for everyone to please go ahead and stop your video. Um, and so then whenever you wanna speak, uh, you know, when it's your turn to speak or you have something to ask or share, um, then you can turn on, you're more than welcome to turn on your video so that way you, you can appear on the screen for everyone else. Uh, a quick, uh, you know, quick example, and I, I'm not trying to, um, you know, pick on Dr. Femi, but uh, Dr. Femi was uh, out of the country in our very first meeting, and he did have some bandwidth issues. So when we stopped the video uh, for all the other panelists, um, his bandwidth kind of helped us a little bit. And so that's just to help all the bandwidth issues for everyone else. Uh, on my end, I'm good to go. I have enough bandwidth to share the video, but it's just for the other folks that may not have the, the, that bandwidth. Um, and with that, Adrian, um, do, you see the, do you see the two questions on the chat? Yes, I see it. FYI, I do not have video uh, from Wayne. Um, and then, uh, so Wayne, um, you can switch your video, or I'm sorry, you can switch your audio uh, right in the box where it says mute. Uh, there should be a drop down. I'm seeing a drop down arrow on my end. And so if you drop down here, uh, you can switch your audio. There's a, there's a tab there that says switch audio. Um, it, you can either be prompted to call in so that way you can hear on your phone for the audio, or you can use your speakers on your laptop or our phone uh, speakers. The other question, uh, Adrian, mm -hmm. mine says uh, everyone uh, there. So if you're sending it, if you're sending it out, my particular one says everyone. So you should check that. Yes, sir, correct. Question. If you want to talk to someone individually, you can, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, you can. For the quick Q&A and getting in the queue, uh, let's all use the everyone, okay? Correct, yes, sir. Anything else, Adrian? Uh, no, sir, that is, uh, that is it from my end. Um, like, like Reed mentioned, uh, if you do have a, a particular question regarding WebEx, um, you can send a message directly to me, uh, Adrian Garcia, and I will see that, and I'll be looking over the chat box just in, just in case anyone has any questions or you want to speak or ask a question for everyone else. That sounds great. Okay, um, let's see. We'll be able to ask questions as we move through the presentation. Uh, let me answer that question. Uh, we went over that, uh, Didi. We will. The answer to that is I'll start my video. Uh, maybe I can do it. The answer is yes, we will definitely be uh, having places to stop. Is there any other questions? Okay, can, did I knock off or can you hear me? We can hear you, Reed. We can okay. hear you, Reed. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, Ann, uh, who's presenting first from CPS? Uh, Chad will be pre presenting our two or three slides. So, Chad, you're up. All right, thank you, Ann. Good evening, everybody. Um, happy to be back talking with you again. Uh, Adrian, are you gonna be able to share our slides? Hi, Chad, it is uploading right now. Okay, very good. So I'll start talking and then as the slides come up, we'll, we'll be able to catch up. Um, the, the, the bulk of tonight's presentation is gonna be uh, a discussion with the Brattle Group. Um, but before I turn it over to them, um, I wanted to just make a couple of comments. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our roadmap uh, for content and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, questions and answers and, and how, we're, uh, how we're making sure that we can get to everybody's question. Um, okay, that's the Brattle presentation. Do you have the other one that Ann sent? Yes, 
Yes, Chad, my apologies. That's okay. That's here, okay. Here it goes, right there. There we go. Okay, go ahead and turn to slide three, if you don't mind. Okay. So we got such great questions last time, some during the presentation, quite a bit after the presentation, and we have since gotten a few via email. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to be uh, forthcoming with information. When you ask a question, we're going to provide an answer. Part of doing that, though, is sharing with you our roadmap of content. So we're going to be very flexible, but here are our thoughts at this point in time. The first topic or the first bucket of information is general information. That was last time. That was two weeks ago. That was the operating model, the financials, energy efficiency, demand side management. Um, that was sort of setting the stage. The next bucket of content is rate design. This is a big bucket um, and we're going to get pretty deep in it. Um, the first uh, presentation on rate design is tonight. Uh, the Brattle group is going to come and talk about the objectives of rate design. That sounds like a simple topic, but there's actually a lot there. So they're, they're going to start with that. And depending on how fast we go, they have the next set of content queued up and ready. Um, you can see at the bottom of this column, we've indicated today's date and the next two meetings. Um, we've done that because we're willing to go as fast or slow as this group needs us to go to get through all of the information. Um, we do want you to stop us and ask questions. Um, we will try to be very disciplined about pausing after every slide um, to see if there's questions. Um, and if there's not, we'll keep going. So we're going to take probably two to three meetings to get through all the rate design content. Then we'll jump into generation strategy. Uh, we'll talk about what we have today. We'll talk about where we think we're going. We'll talk about what flex power is and how we're executing against that. Um, I've labeled that August. We didn't, we didn't put a specific date there um, because it sort of depends on how quickly we get through rate design. Um, but August generally is when we'll talk about generation strategy. Then we'll get into uh, the fourth category, which is social issues. So what does affordability mean? Um, what do customer assistance programs look like? And how do we create fairness across all of our groups of customers? Um, we'll cover that in August slash September. Again, depending on how quickly or slowly we get through the stuff upstream of that. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk through CPS Energy's rates and our rates roadmap. So we'll talk about in depth about all of our current rates, how we believe those rates perform. Are they good rates? Or are they bad rates? Um, we'll talk about what we will do to optimize our rates offering, and we'll offer sort of a specific roadmap of, of that rate design um, for CPS Energy's rates. And you can see I've put sort of September slash October. Um, but again, we're going to go as fast or slow as, as this group needs us to go. Um, Adrian, flip to the next slide. So we, we had such a great uh, set of questions asked. Um, we wanted to share sort of the roadmap so that you know we're going to get to all of these topics. Um, but more than that, what we've tried to do to um, communicate to you that we are going to address questions is we're creating an online inventory. So we're going to take all of the questions that we receive and we're going to categorize them into those same five buckets that you saw on the pri prior slide. Um, and we'll provide answers to them. And we'll post them on the RAC website, which is off of the CPS Energy website. Um, I'll tell you, there, there are not not any up there now. We've started generating the answers to the questions we heard two weeks ago. Um, and so within a week or so, you'll start seeing us post questions and answers on that website. And then each time we get together, we're going to show you uh, a dashboard. So turn to slide five. So this will be a, a recurring view that you see. Um, at the beginning of every meeting, we, we're not going to spend time talking through the answers to questions that have been previously posed, unless you want to, unless you bring up a question again and say, well, I saw this answer and it's, you know, it's not informative enough or I have a subsequent question, that's fine. We'll, we'll go down that path as well. Um, but to try and be efficient, we want to post the answers online for you so that in these meetings, we can cover content, um, you know, new content and keep going. Um, this is an illustrative view, so it is not a real view. Um, the numbers, the 15 and the seven, those are not real numbers. I'm just trying to show and demonstrate to you that 
we're going to keep a category, a catalog of all the questions answered, all the questions asked, and the answers that have been provided so that we can make sure that we're addressing all the questions. It's sort of as simple as that. Um, and so this is sort of our accountability mechanism. So we show up each time and we show you this, and that way you know that we're working on it. Um, and that's really it. That's kind of some housekeeping stuff that, that we wanted to go through with you. Um, and I'll, I'll pause there and see if there are, are any questions before I turn it over to the Brattle group. So Chad, there is a question in the chat from Al wanting to know, is the rate design session the 28 slide presentation? And the answer to that is yes. And we will get through as much of it as we can tonight, but if we don't get through all of it, we'll finish it next time. Yep, that's a, that's a great, great way to answer that. Um, it's hard for us to know how quickly we'll get through content. So what, what Ann and I decided to do with, in, in partnership with the Brattle Groups, we're just gonna generate as much content as possible and we'll be ready to keep going if y'all need to go faster and we'll be ready to stop early if we're not through everything, that's, that's A-OK. -okay. Okay, well, why don't I turn it over to the Brattle Group. Um, the gentleman that's gonna speak with you tonight is Dr. Ahmad Faruqi. Um, he, is, um, he was not able to attend the last RAC meeting, um, but he has been, because he was on a personal vacation. Um, but we've been partnering with him. I'm very excited that he is a member of the Brattle team. He is an expert in his field. He's got like four decades of experience in the rate design area. Um, and so uh, I'll turn it over to, to him and he'll talk through the next uh, deck, Dr. Faruqi. Thank you very much, Chad, uh, for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to the RAC this evening. I did listen in to the very first conversation that took place off the rack. And uh, I was not able to catch the second one because I was in Hawaii for a, a family vacation, the first trip in 15 months or so. But what I have done subsequently is watched the recording. So I think I am fairly up to date on what happened in the second meeting. I've had discussions with the CPS team and with my Brattle colleagues, uh, Augie Ross and uh, Sanam Sergeji, who were both at the previous meeting. So uh, I, hopefully I am up to date. Uh, I wanted to say a couple of opening, uh, make a couple of opening comments before I plunge into the conversation. Uh, the, I'm responding in part to a question that I saw in the chat box, which was, is the rate design session, the 28th slide presentation, this is called an introduction to rate design, and it is part one of the rate design conversation. The next meeting on the 8th of July, we will do a deeper dive into some specific rate design issues and challenges. And then I think we'll be caught up at least at some level on rate design and presumably the third session that will follow will go more into cost of service. Uh, that's at least my initial reaction, but I'm completely open to suggestion depending on how the conversation flows uh, this evening. As I mentioned, um, there are three of us working on this. Uh, it's me and there's Augie and there is Sanam. I will be doing a lot of the presentation today, but I will pause after several of the important slides, particularly in the beginning, and we're very much welcome your comments, suggestions, perspectives, and we have allowed time for that, recognizing the fact that rate design is perhaps a new topic for several of you. Uh, however, everyone knows something about the topic. So some of you might find the introductory material that I'll be presenting tonight to be at the right level. Some of you might find it to be a bit too advanced and some might find it to be a bit too introductory. We have done our best to address the varying backgrounds of the RAC members, but certainly feel free to ask your questions and give us your opinions. That'll give me also a better opportunity to focus on the issues that are of interest to you. So that's sort of the opening line and uh, let's uh, go to the next slide. 
So this is a, a philosophical statement. Uh, it comes all the way from London uh, back in 1938. Um, one of the famous economists who wrote about costs and tariffs was D.J. Bolton. He said something in the preface to his book that I think is timeless. And what he said is worth repeating here. So I'll repeat it. There has never been any lack of interest in the subject of electricity tariffs. Like all charges upon the consumer, they are an unfailing source of annoyance to those who pay and of argument in those who levy them. It's, this debate is as old as time itself. That's my opinion. And then um, Mr. Bolton goes on to say, there is general agreement that appropriate tariffs are essential to any rapid development of electricity supply. And there is complete disagreement as to what constitutes an appropriate tariff. And that sums it up much better than anything I could ever have said. Uh, as Chad indicated, I've been doing this kind of work for four decades now uh, around the US, in Canada, a little bit in Mexico, uh, a lot of work in Asia Pacific and the Middle East and in South Africa as well, and in Latin America more recently. So this is a global challenge that you will never make everyone happy with any tariff. There is no ideal tariff out there. Some will like it and some will ignore it and some will hate it and some will protest it. All of those things I've seen happening on all of the six continents that the world is comprised of. And so I'm just making this as an introductory comment, not to suggest that you shouldn't disagree with what I'm saying. You certainly should. And actually, I expect you to. And I suspect one of the challenges we will have, given the diverse backgrounds of the RAC members, we will have divergence of opinion on these issues of what is a good tariff and what is not a good tariff. We have gone through these kinds of meetings in more recently in the Canadian provinces of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. We have earlier done work in the province of Ontario, and that's in addition to California and New York and Connecticut and Illinois and, and so on and so forth. So we expect you to give us your opinions, to be candid in what you tell us, but also please to provide your reasoning so that we can figure out what is the context with which you're making your comments. Next slide, please. So this is just to get us all on the same page. Tariffs consist of multiple elements. And by the way, on terminology, I'm going to use the term tariffs and rate design interchangeably. That's how it is throughout the globe. But sometimes people say, oh, a tariff is a sheet on which the rate design is laid out. The rate design could be, for example, a time of use rate but the tariff has the specific prices that will be charged during the peak period, the off-peak period, and a fixed charge if there is one, and maybe a demand charge if there is one. So, so keeping that in mind, what we have seen throughout the US and in much of the globe is tariffs are typically divided into two categories, mass market, which is residential, and small business or commercial customers and large commercial and industrial customers. For the mass market, tariffs typically include a customer charge. It would be $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month, We've even seen $30 a month. Depends on which utility we are looking at and which state they're located in. Are they investor owned? Are they publicly owned like CPS? Or are they a cooperative like Holy Cross Energy in Colorado? So that's the customer charge. And then there is the energy charge, which basically measures the flow of electricity, which as you know, is measured in kilowatt hours. It's a measure of energy. And it may vary by time of consumption, and then that's when it becomes a time of use rate. And in most cases for the mass market customers, it makes up the bulk of the customer's bill. It could be as much as 90% in California, for the investor-owned utilities, I, by the way, I live in San Francisco in the Bay Area, 
Um, there is no fixed charge at all. It is literally zero dollars. But you go to the capital of California, Sacramento, which is serviced by Sacramento Municipal Utilities District or SMUD, a municipal utility, half a million customers there. And they have a fixed charge of around $20. So it varies a lot even in the same state, depending on the ownership structure. And then you go to the large commercial and industrial customers. And in general, they'll have a customer charge and an energy charge, but they will also have something called a demand charge, which sort of measures, as some people call it, the width of the pipe. It's instantaneous demand or for those of you who recall physics with some affection, it's a measure of the power of electricity as opposed to the energy of electricity. So one is flow, one is width, and the demand charge, as it is called, can be based on the customer's maximum demand, regardless of time of occurrence, or it could be based on maximum coincident demand. In other words, the customer's demand when the system is having a peak or a combination of the two. Large customers have more complex tariffs than small customers. More of the customer's bill, if you're a large CNI customer, will come from a demand charge. The national average is around 25% is demand for large customers and 75% is energy. For residential customers, uh, as I said, it's more heavily tilted towards the energy charge, which could be upwards of 90% could even be 100%. But that's just to get the definitions out of the way and to give you something just as a point of reference. And I'm sure all of you have seen your own tariffs as customers. If you own a business, you probably have seen your tariffs for the business. And some of you may be associated with larger enterprises that also have a demand charge. So this is just to get all of us on the same page as to the kinds of structures that are out there for tariffs. Next, please. Hey, Ahmed, uh, yeah. this is Augie real quick. I just like to interject one point. Sure. Um, and we will get into cost in more detail in the coming, um, maybe even a little bit today, but more in the coming weeks. Um, but these three concepts here, the customer charge, the energy charge, and the demand charge, those are also the three main cost categories in the electricity system. That is, what is it that generates electricity costs? We, carry, we put them into three buckets. One is the customer cost, that when you add a customer to the network, there's specific costs that arise. The other is cons uh, electricity consumption to produce another kilowatt of uh, energy. That's a, a cost driver. And the third is the capacity, how big the pipe has to be. Those are the three fundamental con cost concepts from which all these kind of rate designs then uh, progress. Yeah, thank you, that was very helpful. And actually that allows me to make another point, which is that rates that reflect the cost structure of the grid more accurately are, are rates that include all of these three charges. And sometimes they're called three-part rates because they have three parts, a customer charge, an energy charge, and a demand charge. We will talk more about three-part rates uh, in Next, uh, in the next rack meeting, we won't have much time to get into those here. And, and when I'll make one other comment in case some of you are wondering, why are tariffs different between mass market and large customers? The simple reasoning is the large customers have more sophisticated meters that can measure not only energy, but also measure demand. And that has historically been true for a hundred years, that large customers have had meters capable of measuring demand Whereas for residential customers, it is a very new development made possible by the rollout of smart meters. Some of you might be familiar with the term AMI, which stands for Advanced Metering Infrastructure. That basically is what smart meters are. And smart meters can measure demand as well as energy. In the US, we have roughly 140 million residential customers or households and of those, about 100 million today have smart meters. So the reason that three-part rates don't exist at a high level yet in the residential and small CNI market is because the meters were incapable of doing the measurement. 
In other words, there was a technological barrier that prevented the uh, sending out of cost-reflective tariffs to residential and small commercial customers. That barrier has mostly been overcome, but there's another barrier that still has to be overcome, and we'll get into that to some extent this evening, but more perhaps uh, in the next RAC meeting. The other barrier is customer tolerance or acceptance or understanding of more complex tariffs is still a bit of a question mark. And there are also questions that people raise about the ethics of imposing a demand charge on a residential or small CNI customer. We'll come back to all of those uh, either later tonight or uh, perhaps in the next RAC meeting. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. I'm hoping by now um, this will be uh, an obvious statement that rate design involves making trade-offs against three competing goals. The first one is cost reflectivity, and that is what Augie was saying is the cost structure has three elements, the customer charge, the energy charge, and the capacity or demand charge. The more cost reflective it is, the less simple it's going to be, and therefore the more difficult it'll be to get customers to accept it. Customers, I can tell you in Saudi Arabia, where I did a lot of consulting work, even large customers don't have a demand charge. And I was surprised. I did a lot of work there and I said, you know, you have a bit, lot of large industrial customers, et cetera, petrochemical facilities, refineries, uh, steel mills, pulp and paper, et cetera, et cetera. And so we had a workshop with customers there to see what would be their point of view if demand charges were to be included in their tariffs, like they are worldwide. And the objection was, oh, you're going to charge us twice for the same product. How clever of you. I mean, it was not going to be charging you twice. The energy charge would go down and would be replaced with the demand charge, but there was a customer trust issue. So simplicity, acceptability, and also it depends on what relationship the utility has with its customers. If the relationship is one of trust, it's a lot easier to make changes in rates. Like SMUD has a very good rapport with its customer base. It has moved all of its customers to time of use rates a couple of years ago. Uh, Fort Collins in Colorado, uh, which is also a municipality, has moved all of its customers on a mandatory time of use rate. No issues, no concerns, good bonding relationship with the customers. No suspicion, no distrust was aroused when those changes were made. Of course, a lot of education took place over a three to five year period before those changes came about. So we'll, we'll come back to those dimensions. But simplicity, acceptability, behind those is the trust factor. And the final factor, which is actually in some ways the most important factor, is what will, I, will it do to my bill? If my bill is going to go up, then I'm going to resist being put on that rate. I'd rather have an option of picking it or not picking it. And so if you look at those three, they form the three vertices of a triangle. And that's a decision that the board has to make. That's a decision that the RAC can advise upon in this context. And that's a decision that can be informed by what other utilities are doing. But ultimately, each utility in each jurisdiction has to make that trade-off looking at its history of how customers will take to the rate or not take to the rate. And it also affects the speed at which you can change rates. Next slide, please. So now we are going to do a brief overview of what people call rate design principles. Some people also call them rate design objectives. So whether it's an objective or a principle, it's the same concept. And the idea is when we design a rate, whether it's a flat rate or a rate with a demand charge or a time of use rate or a fixed bill or anything else, what are the principles that we should follow? And these principles have evolved with time. Just a historical point of reference here, most of them have come out of a single book and that book was written in 1961 by Professor Bonbright, who was a professor at Columbia University, and he called it the Principles of Public Utility Rates. So that book 
even by people who don't like what he says, is still regarded as a classic. Actually, in, in one proceeding in Arizona, where I cited this, I was asked if this book was kind of um, like the Bible of rate design. And uh, this was during a cross-examination, so you're not supposed to bring up religion in cross-examination questions. But uh, my response was, it is timeless, kind of like the Bible, as far as rate design goes. Okay, so what are these principles? So what I'm showing you here are seven. They are more than seven, but these are the high level principles. And I will go through them one at a time. And I will pause after each principle to see what you make of that principle, because each of you is on the rack and is qualified to evaluate and comment on what principles should be used for rate design. And you can also tell us whether you think this is a good principle that's applicable or not a good principle. So I'm going to, after each principle is presented, I'm going to pause and let you make your comments or ask questions. So let me just first list the principles. So the first one is economic efficiency. And I will define that when I get to that slide. The second one is equitable cost allocation among customers. The third one is revenue stability for the utility. The fourth one is bill stability for the customer. The next one is customer satisfaction. The next one is affordability. And the last one is decarbonization. So as you can imagine, decarbonization is a relatively new principle, but in the last two years where I have been discussing rate design principles and objectives, this has always come up. Obviously it is a principle that back in 1961, Professor Bonbright had never even imagined would be an issue. His book, by the way, was updated in 1988. That's the second edition. And it's not in that edition either, but it's certainly coming up a lot in every state of the union. Affordability was implicit in the Bonbright principles, but really was not listed there. However, as we all know, in the last few years, particularly post pandemic, uh, we have seen that become a very, very important issue. Okay, so those are the seven. I will go through each one and pause and get your input. And then after we are done with the seven, I'm going to uh, also step, stop talking and ask you if we have omitted any principle that you think is important. And if so, please tell us what that principle is, because we want to make sure before we plunge into rate design and the specifics of time of use rates and demand charges and fixed charges and all of those interesting concepts, that at least we have some agreement on what and what principles should guide the choice of tariffs. Okay, next one, please. So the first one is economic efficiency. And I, I know there are several people who have uh, degrees in, in law, who have degrees in public administration, who have degrees in business administration. I remember from the very first RAC meeting that one or two of you have even worked on tariffs a while ago. So you might be very familiar with this, but let me repeat what the concept is just to make sure we are all on the same page. Now, if you're an economist, this would appear to be an obvious principle. But actually, if you were to talk to professors of economics at any university anywhere on the globe, they will tell you this is the only principle worth paying attention to. I, by, by the way, I'm an economist, as are my two colleagues here, but I certainly don't agree with that. And maybe I'm regarded as a heretic by my academic uh, colleagues elsewhere. Economic efficiency is one of many principles, as you will see. So what does this principle tell us? This principle, you can also call it marginal cost pricing, which is a term that might mean something to some of you and maybe not to others. But basically I'm going to define it here is the price of electricity should be set equal to the incremental cost of providing electricity. So if it costs you 10 cents to produce a kilowatt hour, the price should be set equal to 10 cents. Now, 
here's the challenge. I'll give you a quick example. In California, it has been estimated that producing an incremental kilowatt hour costs eight cents per kilowatt hour. What is the tariff? For the utility that serves me as a customer, that tariff is 28 cents. Eight cents is the marginal cost, but 28 cents is the average cost. In other words, that's the amount I have to pay. Why is that? Well, because there are all those fixed costs and California is, is a unique situation with all of the environmental regulations and what have you. There are all kinds of reasons why the fixed cost is so high, but the tariff, it was said equal to just the marginal cost would be eight cents. It obviously would not recover the revenue needed for the utilities to survive. And that's why they need the other 20 cents. Okay, so just, just part that thought for a moment, we'll come back to California when that makes sense. But sticking with this principle, what this says is, if you set the price equal to the incremental cost, then consumers and producers will produce and consume exactly the right amount of electricity. Resources will not be wasted and there will be some kind of optimum situation that will be arrived at. So in a nutshell, that's the economic efficiency principle. If you ever took Econ 1A, this is all we are saying is Econ 1A. There's more to life, of course, than Econ 1A. And what are some of those other considerations? So let me mention a couple of those. The first one I already gave you a hint at, utilities may not be able to achieve full cost recovery if price is at equal to incremental cost, since they have a lot of fixed costs in generation transmission and distribution assets. In California, it's 28 versus eight for the investor-owned utilities and for the PG&E in particular, Pacific Gas and Electric. The numbers vary by utility. Now you go to Sacramento Municipal Utilities District, it isn't quite as stark. They have a different cost structure, but they still have a fixed cost. They have a fixed charge of $20. PG&E has a fixed charge of $0. So there are different ways of recovering revenue. And the second, concern that arises from this principle is that this principle does not prioritize social goals such as protecting vulnerable consumers and promoting renewable energy resources. So what has California done to protect the vulnerable customers? It is not following this principle. What it is doing is it's saying we'll use average cost pricing and if you are a vulnerable customer and they define it with reference to the federal poverty guideline. So much as a percent of the federal poverty guideline for one individual versus two versus three versus four. And also if you're on social security or if you have medical conditions, then they have a special program called CARE, California Affordable Rates for Energy. And that gives you a 35% discount on your bill. That's how they're attending I'm gonna, uh, you're, you're breaking up, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Not working? I, I could hear, I could hear him. Okay, is it working now? He can hear you now, maybe it's best you turn your video off and just talk. Yeah, yeah, I, I, something must have happened which I didn't realize. Thank you for alerting me. Okay, so. Was there a comment? Okay, so what I was gonna do was just tell you, and maybe my, my voice broke up when I was speaking. I was saying that this principle does not prioritize social goals, such as protecting vulnerable consumers and promoting renewable energy. So uh, I mentioned the California example where they have special measures to address the vulnerability issue. And by the way, that is also to be found in many, many utilities across the country. So, so that is the economic efficiency principle. And why don't I pause here and um, take your questions and comments. So uh, it, it's your turn now to uh, opine on how important uh, you think uh, this is. So a question has come in, does the eight cent per kilowatt hour number that I mentioned include generation distribution assets and labor? It includes the marginal cost of producing electricity. So it's primarily a generation number. 
So that's for that specific example that I mentioned. But let me uh, also ask you and welcome any comments you have on how important is economic efficiency to you as you think of uh, red design. Okay, so another question came in. Could you repeat the California example? What is the percentage and terms? Okay, so um, the California example I gave was for Pacific Gas and Electric Company, which is the largest electric and gas utility in the state. It has 5 million customers. Um, they have, for residential customers, an average rate of 28 cents per kilowatt hour. And according to economists at UC Berkeley, like Severin Borenstein and his team, the marginal cost or incremental cost for providing a kilowatt hour is eight cents. I have not seen the details on how they computed it. I think it is probably largely the generation cost and may not include the transmission and distribution cost. Maybe the number would be a little higher. What is the percentage and terms? So could, could you clarify that as to what you mean by uh, LUSF? Yes, I can. Thank you, Doctor. I um, was specifically at you. You were interrupted as you were saying that in the California example, they use the average cost pricing, but they have a program called CARE, and it specifically is for dis disabled or Social Security um, uh, income folks. And so, I wanted you to add, clarify that because that's where you uh, you were cut off. Um, yeah. Okay. Know. Got you. Got you. Excellent. Now I understand the percentage. So, so the CARE program has some eligibility criteria, one of which is what is your income, how many people are in your household, and how does your income compare to the federal poverty guideline. If you meet that certain threshold, like a formula, then you will get a 35% discount on your electric bill and a 20% discount on your gas bill. I don't know why the percentages are different, but that's what they are. 35% for electric and 20% for natural gas. And it applies to all customers of the investor-owned utility. So there are three investor-owned utilities in the state. All, all three of them have this program applying to them. In addition, uh, you could be on Social Security and you could be a disabled person. So it is not just your income, but those two other factors that kick in as well. So a lot of senior citizens are on it. And um, if you are a care customer who meets those criteria, you can get free of charge a lot of energy efficiency benefits as well, uh, like uh, weatherization, like even changing some of your appliances. Now, the big question is, where does that money come from? And it is coming from all of the other residential customers. So it's like a redistribution of the bill within the residential class. And according to what I have heard and read, about a third of the customers in California classify as being care customers and are benefiting from the, the discount. There's another question about, can you go over the consideration regarding renewables? So the, the renewable policies, uh, not just in California, but nationwide, are of two types. One is on the supply side. What can you do to change the resource mix? So there is a lot of uh, emphasis being placed uh, on retiring plants that run on fossil fuels and shifting more towards decarbonized energy resources like solar and wind and battery storage and all of those, that's sort of the supply side revolution that's happening around the country. Uh, but in addition, you can incentivize customers to focus more um, in um, using uh, less electricity, emphasizing energy efficiency, kind of like you have the STEP program, but in addition, incentivizing them uh, to perhaps buy power that has a more green content. And many utilities have green tariffs. Uh, but in addition, you can encourage them to install solar panels on their roof, which I know CPS does, and there are some 
issues that arise anytime you incentivize customers to install solar on the roof. There's also the federal tax credit to encourage them. You can also encourage them to buy an electric car. All of those are designed to emphasize the use of renewable energy. Then there's another question, uh, why would we not include this principle? Cost has to be a part of the formula. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. It, it, well, you, sk you skipped a question, that's why. Uh, I'm, could, could you repeat the question? I was just trying to, to point out that this has to be, a, to me, a very important principle because um, cost has to play into how we're going to basically set rates. That's all I was trying to make. Okay, okay. So, so, so this principle does look at cost. And actually, it says the price of electricity should be set equal to the incremental cost of providing electricity. So it is focusing just on incremental cost and not the total cost structure. That is a challenge posed by this principle, which is addressed by the other principles that will follow. Okay, thank you. I didn't understand. Uh, Augie, do you want to add anything or Sanam? Yeah, I, I could just add um, uh, real quick and we'll kind of, we'll get into this. So you know, when Amin said that the average price in California is 28 cents or the average yeah, price is 28 cents, um, that, that is also a cost-based price. It just it's it's not the marginal cost. It's and we'll learn how um, a utility um, comes up with a, a, a rate based on the, their underlying historical cost. Um, so so the so the cost is is when we talk about cost of an electricity service, uh, the, the kind that we're going to see in common practice is what is called the historical or embedded cost. Um, the marginal cost plays a key role in things that are very important today about, you know, whether a customer decides to purchase solar PV like in California, given that the price is so high, they can purchase uh, distributed energy resources, which are much lower marginal cost. Uh, so it does play a role in terms of decisions customers make and, and, and investments they make. Um, but when we get into costs, the more common cost that we, we, we deal with is you know, what the cost that the company has already uh, incurred in terms of how much is spent for generation, for distribution. And for those, there's always going to be a divergence between the marginal cost and the historical cost. So I just wanted to add that point. I think that is a very important point because people think cost is cost, but the reality is there are many kinds of costs. There are marginal costs, the incremental cost, which some people call forward-looking cost, and then there's average cost or historical cost or incremental cost, which some people call backward-looking cost. But think of it like this. Uh, when you go to the grocery store to buy bananas, you're paying a certain price for that banana and you probably don't think too hard. Is it the marginal cost that they have priced this at? Or is it the average cost? You just think, is this a reasonable price for me to pay for bananas at this store? Or should I go to another store, the farmer's market and get it at lower cost? So people do shop around. And again, the point about solar, I think is a very important point. California has 1.1 million solar roofs. The whole country has 2.2 million. So exactly 50% are in one state. And if you ever wonder why, the obvious answer is because California has become so expensive to buy electricity from the grid. You know, at that 28 cent number, people are comparing that number to the 10 cents per kilowatt hour they pay if they have solar on their roof. So that's what's happening is if costs keep on rising for utilities, then customers will shop around and whether or not they have choice of retailers, they don't need to have choice of retailers. At the minimum, they can just put in a more efficient air conditioner and consume less, lower their bill, or they can put solar on the roof and pay even less. And that's why California has all of these issues. Now, it's not sustainable. And perhaps in next week's, or sorry, the next RAC meeting, 
we'll get into some of these issues of sustainability and cost shifting, and uh, sometimes they're called cross subsidies. Uh, but today, we're going to just discuss them at a high level. And I, I would say, looking at the clock here, uh, it's, it's amazing how much time this economic efficiency principle has consumed. So um, let me see, there's one more question that's come up. Let, let's address it, and then I want to move uh, to the next principle. So the comment is, CPS describes itself uh, sorry, it kind of popped, it moved up, I have to lower it. Describes itself as a cost recovery business, and this is all inclusive generation delivery and politically, politically mandated programs. A continuous for a new cast, California is also has the most unreliable energy rolling brownouts, etc. Well, as, as a Californian, I can tell you, I totally agree with, with that second statement about the service is very expensive and it is becoming increasingly unreliable. However, that is not true of every California utility. SMUD is an exception, being a municipal utility. There are many other municipal utilities that have found ways to provide electricity in a more affordable fashion. They have access to federal preference power and, and various other concepts. But I, I don't want to get into a big California discussion just now. Maybe we should save that for, for the next RAC meeting. Augie, did you have a comment? Yeah, no, I just, Al's first comment, yes, it's, it's certainly a cost recovery business. Most utilities, when you um, calculate what is called the revenue requirement, what they're doing is uh, trying to recover all their historical costs. So that's exactly the right way to think about it. And so, you know, when you think about economic efficiency, just think about cost. So uh, how much weight am I gonna put on this principle of the rates should, should be based on underlying fundamental costs? And that's, I think that's a good way of thinking of the economic efficiency principle. Excellent. All right. Um, uh, I would say let's move on then to the next principle. So next slide, please. So this issue uh, of equitable cost allocation among consumers. What does that mean? It's the second most important principle. What it means is that no consumer should unintentionally subsidize another consumer. This is often re referred to as the cross subsidization. In other words, we should try to minimize cross subsidization. So how does that happen? Rates should reflect the full cost of service. If they reflect the full, in other words, each customer should pay a fair share of the cost they're imposing on the grid. And I'll give you just one example. There are many others that I'm sure you can suggest. So if you have flat rates, by which I mean rates that do not vary by time of day, and that's what it is for uh, roughly, I would say 95% of the customers today in the United States, they have flat rates. They don't have time of use rates. So then if you have a customer who is using a lot of air conditioning and has a very peaky load shape, and you have another customer who does not have air conditioning and has a relatively flatter load shape, then the customer who's very peaky is demanding more from the grid than what they're paying. And the customer with the flatter load shape is actually paying more than they should be paying. So there is an inequity there between customers, which right now people are not aware of because they only have flat rates. And so um, that, that, that's- so don't, uh, don't, most people, don't most companies have graduated rates like CPS? That's what we're talking about here. And so if, if you have a graduated rate, you use more electricity, you pay a higher rate. That's what happens here. So what you just said is not true. Okay, so let me, Dana, that is a good question. And let me say that very few utilities have inclining block rates like you do. And so I'm making a general statement among peaky versus less peaky customers. Now, California, Dana had inclining block rates for many, many years and is beginning to flatten them. The same thing is true in Colorado. The same thing is true in Michigan. The same thing is true at SMUD. The same thing is true at British Columbia. Why is that? Because studies have shown that inclining block rates are not cost justified. They're just a form of trying to address this 
inequity, if you will, based on usage. There's a presumption that large users are more affluent, but that has not been shown to be the case. There's lots of data to show that large consumers are often low income consumers with large families living in poorly insulated homes with old appliances. So I, I don't want to get into a big discussion on that, but what I'm going to say well, is- Well, okay, why not? Because it's pertinent. And you know, you, you well, may be right on that, but I mean, the, the big users in San Antonio, to my knowledge, are, are not people with large families that are, are they're industrial and, and business users. So, I mean- oh, Okay, so, so we are just talking in this, uh, at this point about just residential. Yes, different classes have different race structures, and they, that, that's a whole relevant discussion, is how should cost be allocated between classes? But I'm just focusing on cost allocation within a class. And I'm saying well, that- why, why, why are you doing that if, we, if we're dealing with all the customers across the city? Because we are saving that for the third session where we will be discussing cost allocation among classes. Yeah, let me add, just let me just jump in a, a, a couple of things. This, this principle here, um, you, you can kind of think of it as a second cousin to the first principle. It's also related to cost, and it's it's trying to get at um, you know how we allocate the cost to the different classes of customers: the revenue, the residential class, commercial class, the industrial class, um, and having an, an allocation methodology, which we'll talk about in more detail later, which. Um, which is fair among those different classes. And, and the standard we kind of go by is how much each class is using the, 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 the grid in terms of its consumption during the peak hour, uh, its overall consumption during the year. Uh, that's kind of you know the principle we have here and is trying to get at eliminated any undue discrimination among classes of customers. Um, what, what, what Ahmed is talking about as well is even within a class, yeah, you can have kind of unintentional um, differences in how much individual residential customer is allocated its share of that residential class, say revenue requirement, based on its characteristics of how it consumes energy during the day, whether it's got a DER or what have you. But this principle is trying to, we know we're not gonna be perfect on that, but how much should we try to eliminate that type of unintentional subsidization either across classes or within a class, uh, customers within a class? Right, so I, I, I would say let's, let's come back to the cost allocation among classes. I, it is a very valid question and that is certainly an important issue, but I'm assuming at this point that we are focusing on one class at a time. And all I'm saying is as far as rate design goes, rate design says we should make sure that within a class, there are no cross subsidies. Now, there's a question that came up in the chat box. Is the care program an intentional cross subsidization? The answer is yes, absolutely. It is done with full awareness of what the magnitude is. And the estimate I've seen is a $1 billion a year cross subsidy between care customers and non-care customers. Now, when it comes to time of use rates, the cross subsidy might be as much as $3 billion per year between customers with peakier load shapes versus customers with flatter load shapes. And as a result of that, California is now moving to time of use pricing for all of its customers to minimize that subsidy and also to encourage better use of the grid and promote decarbonization. Now, so that, that's sort of the equitable issue, and we have only touched the tip of the iceberg, not implying we have covered everything there. But what you might want to think about, and, and some of this discussion I think is suggestive of that, that fairness is very subjective. And what is fair for one customer is not fair to another customer. So this becomes a policy issue more than just an academic issue. Now, there is another comment from Al. I cannot get over the fact that 50% of CPS ratepayers are behind in payments 
and trying to look forward to what we can add to that. So, so that's an affordability question, which is one of the principles we'll be getting into very soon. Uh, it is not a principle in the bond right textbook, but it's certainly a real life consideration, particularly in areas such as yours. Uh, even in California, as I said, 35% or 40% of the customers are on that care program. Um, so, and then the other comment from Al is about the cost allocation across classes. By the way, one other municipal utility, Salt River Project, which has about a million customers in Arizona, uh, I was part of some workshops there a few years ago, and uh, not to get into the details, but the cost allocation question was front and center in those workshops. So what they did for each class, they calculated the revenue, and they calculated the cost of serving the class. They took the ratio of those two, and they said, the ratio of revenues being collected to cost being imposed should be within plus or minus 10% of one. In other words, if they were perfectly balanced, you would have a ratio of one. And so they said, we will allow for some variation, plus or minus 10% from that one, but otherwise we will you know, do our best to stay within those boundaries. Other utilities have plus or minus 5%. And that's something that uh, perhaps Augie and can get into in more detail uh, in the, the third session that will follow. Uh, Maude, this is Reed for a minute here. If I could just kind of break in. We've got an uh, awful lot to get through, and I, these questions are very important. So if we could, everyone, put them on the chat. And if we can't get to all of them, uh, we'll get to them as we can uh, uh, afterwards. But we, we've got to keep the chat uh, process going as opposed to uh, just talking, although I just interrupted, I guess I apologize for that. But uh, so let's keep going and uh, we'll uh, take and we'll have, I might take the questions as he can. If we can't, we'll log them back and, and get them all answered. So uh, please, let's, uh, let's move on uh, with the education. We all have a lot of questions that relate specifically to CPS. We'll get to that but let's get through this education if we can. Thank you, go ahead, Amon. Excellent, Reed. Well, thank you for that guidance. I was looking at the clock and it's moving much faster than I'm talking, so I guess I better start moving fast. Okay, so let's go to the next principle. Next slide. The next principle is revenue stability. To continue providing reliable utility service, of course, utilities need revenue stability. It's a very capital intensive business. Substantial investment is required to acquire, maintain, and operate generation, transmission, and distribution assets. If the money is not coming in, the utility will not be in business for very long. Revenue stability is needed to ensure access to capital. And so, uh, what are the other considerations? Well, uh, again, there are other issues. I think some of your comments indicate that affordability is a challenge. So if the utility is collecting more revenue than people can afford to pay. If, uh, as was stated by somebody, 50% of the customers are unable to pay, then we have a challenge. Uh, and that challenge is the affordability issue. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep moving. Next slide, please. And by the way, I'm reading the chat. I'm not ignoring it, but I'm following uh, the chair, chairman's guidance here. The next rate design principle is build stability. Consumers don't want their bills fluctuating wildly. There are cash flow issues. Um, there's month to month variation due to seasonality and also variation in weather across the years. Most customers are able to cope with that, but some are not. And so how do utilities cope with it? The utilities, some of them provide balanced bill payment plans, which is the same amount every month. And at the end of the year, there's a true up. A new development is some utilities are now offering subscription plans. It's a guaranteed bill. It's based on your past few years of history and uh, it's just locked in an average plus a small markup to protect against weather fluctuations. Those plans are uh, creating excitement, uh, positive as well as negative. Some of the consumer advocacy groups and some of the environmental groups, there are odds on those. The environmental groups don't like the subscription plans because they think 
basically it means you can consume as much as you want and it's just locked in. It's like you can see as many movies as you want on Netflix without having to pay more for those. However, Netflix doesn't have environmental issues if people watch more movies. Uh, maybe there's some social issues of addiction, but there's certainly no environmental issues. But with electricity, if you're consuming a lot, then that could create some environmental concerns. So uh, what we have here is um, just going to make Hey, Ahmad, you cut out on us there. Can you check your, uh, can you check your, your audio, please? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, what happened was the other phone rang and it is connected to the internet, unfortunately. So, uh, but you can hear me now, I take it. Okay. So what I was saying was that uh, there are ways to address this concern. And um, we will uh, come back to the different methods for dealing with build stability. Let's go to the next one. The next one is customer satisfaction. We need customers to buy in to the rate for that rate to work. In other words, they need to see something is good for them and uh, only then will they sign on. Rates need to be simple for customers to understand them, and they need to be simple for customers to respond to them. So what we have discovered through our research, and I believe in the last RAC meeting, uh, Sanam uh, talked about the fact that different customers have different needs and risk tolerances. Some are willing to go with prices that fluctuate so they can lower their bill. Others want stability and are willing to pay a bit more for that. It's just like when you have a mortgage, you can get an adjustable rate mortgage or a fixed rate mortgage. They appeal to different people. So these kinds of options are more and more being looked at by utilities. So instead of having just a single rate, like the inclining block rate that you have, uh, which uh, some of you mentioned, uh, you might consider offering other alternatives to customers. So that's the customer satisfaction principle. Next, please. Then comes affordability, which we have been discussing quite a bit. And I have acknowledged here the care program that California has. Uh, at the national level, just to set things in perspective, a widely used estimate of the energy burden is 6%. In other words, 6% of the customer's income should go towards their energy bills, electricity and gas, and no more. Utilities and government agencies are taking a variety of measures to meet that goal. Rate design is one of those measures, but then there are other measures such as weatherization and lighting upgrades, and in some cases, even changing the appliances. So affordability cannot just be tackled with rate design. It has to be addressed by a variety of different measures that the utilities will undertake. Next, please. And then comes the last principle, which is decarbonization. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, more and more utilities are setting goals to decarbonize their operations by certain dates, such as 2035. I know one cooperative that has set 2030. I know other utilities that have set 2040. 2050, one has even set it at 2070. Usually it, it's way out there. And then the question is, what can you do through rate design to encourage it? So you can have rate designs to encourage the efficient use of appliances, like don't use them during the peak hour. If you have an electric car, don't charge it during the peak hour, please charge it in the off peak hour. So rate design can play a role in decarbonization. So those are the principles and let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to pause here and maybe if we can take a few minutes to address the issues on this slide. The first one is, I know I've heard from several of you on, on many of these principles, but here's your chance if you haven't made any comment on the principles to please tell us what you make of these seven principles do they address all of your concerns as far as rate design goes, not the rate level? 
So do not get into the rate level issue here. That's, uh, that's a different issue, revenue requirement. This is just simply about the structure of the rate. Do you think these principles are the appropriate principles that should guide the development of rates? So that's the first question and I'll pause and feel free to comment. Ahmed, there is a question there about whether encouraging conservation should be a principle, uh, rate design principle, how often maybe you've come across that. Good question. Uh, that it, it, implicitly it is there in the economic efficiency principle, which says you should price it at marginal cost. If the marginal cost is high, then that would argue for a higher rate. And that's why a lot of people have inclining block rates or graduated rates. The problem is most of the time they are not cost reflective and they create cross subsidies. So that's why they are being flattened in most areas. Uh, they're also not being shown to prove, you, you cannot prove that conservation actually occurred. So the question is, what is the best way to incentivize conservation? I think it is through an energy efficiency program. Rates should be cost reflective uh, they should be based on marginal cost, but if you think that that hasn't brought about enough conservation and you need more for resource planning reasons, then you need to, uh, you know, basically do more conservation programs. And just real quick on that one, Ahmed, um, and everybody, so the inclining block rates traditionally has been a, something called a conservation uh, rate design uh, element, uh, kind of to you know, give a disincentive for additional uh, uh, consumption. Um, as we're moving towards more electrification, it becomes uh, something that, you know, you, you may, as more and more renewable, it, it, you get more and more generation from renewable resources, um, you actually might have an incentive uh, to want more consumption in these, at, at the upper, lower, at the higher ends of the, of the blocks as well. So that, that could be a little bit different going forward than what it's been in the past. Right, and if I can also add one more thing here, um, you know, even though rate design has multiple objectives, uh, you know, the foremost objective of the, the rates is to um, recover the costs. Um, so even though we're trying to find this balance between these multiple objectives, it just becomes very sustainable if you keep adding missions uh, on, on rate design because there's only so much you could achieve with just one tool, which is rate design. So this goes back to Ahmed's point about, you know, if there are objectives around conservation and, 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 and more efficiency, it's, they are better addressed through uh, specific programs geared towards uh, incentivizing and, and, and making sure uh, those, uh, you know, infrastructure and appliance uh, upgrades are, are happening through those uh, other programs. Very valid points. Um, so I want to move to the next question, which is, are there any other rate design principles that you would like to suggest? And so this is your chance to tell us that these seven principles are missing something important. And there's principle number eight that should be added to the list. So tell us uh, in the next uh, few minutes, uh, what would that other principle be? And there could be eight or nine or 10. Uh, but, but but fire away. I guess um, people can think about it, but I can tell you there is an eighth principle that we have enlisted, which is always there, which is um, a political acceptability of a rate design change. When California moved ahead back in the year 2015 to flatten the tiered rates, they had five tiers, if you can imagine, the most of any utility in the US, five tiers. Um, they did a lot of discussion on all the issues that came up today. Conservation, will it be incentivized or de-incentivized? What about small users and large users? The commission unanimously voted to flatten them. And then the next day, the headline in the paper was, the California Commission just decided to raise rates for 73% of the customers. Because some customers were going to see higher rates, 
others were going to see lower rates, but the number who would see higher rates was higher. And some of them would see a, a bill go up by one penny, and some would see going up at two pennies, but those were all counted. And so it is always going to be a political issue. I'll give you another example. In the province of Ontario in Canada, for distribution charges, they decided that the distribution charge should be a separate charge and it should be a flat number, like $30 a month or $50 a month. There's no reason why it should be volumetric because it is a flat concept recovering distribution system cost. And they moved ahead and they were able to do it with hardly any objections. But any utility in the US that has tried it has not been able to. In Texas in particular, the PUC, uh, Commissioner Ken Anderson, who was there for a long time, he wanted to move ahead with a similar approach because of all the reasons that Ontario had laid out. Uh, he couldn't. He, he said the legislature is not on board with it. So there's usually more to rate design than the seven principles. Uh, it is the politics. It is the optics. It is the history. It is a question of trust. All of those factors are there. But I mean, there's no way we can do any analysis of those from an economics perspective. Looks like, uh, Wesley, you wanted to say something. Uh, no, I just wanted you to be sure and see uh, Eloise's question. Then we've got another one in from uh, uh, a couple other people. Just wanted to call your attention to that. Yeah, let, let me take a quick shot at Eloise's um, question. And I, I think it comes to, you know, what rate, can, rate design can do, what it's good at doing, and what there might be limitations in doing, and where other kind of tools could be more efficient. So certainly, wealth gap, you know, rate design, you're talking about discounts, um, you know, in, in terms of either the care program or special riders for low income individuals. Uh, that's certainly where rate design uh, can be used. Um, you know, where, where it doesn't happen, where we don't see is actually much lower rates for, for, for you know, low income individuals, as opposed to keeping the rates um, within what comes out of this um, process, you know, applying these principles, having those rates apply, and then um, providing discounts off those uh, rates, off the bills that come from those rates, as opposed to actually having a much lower, you know, demand charge or energy charge or customer charge. Um, and so things like reducing carbon, uh, there, there's limits to what rate design can do as opposed to and a renewable energy programs uh, that are out there or what uh, a utility can do in their uh, integrated resource plan that provides subsidies for or incentives for building generation plant. So I just wanted to kind of make that point as well. And let me also supplement that with one comment, which I think I'm seeing in the chat box and it comes up every time, which is, shouldn't we have more discounts for low income customers uh, most economists would say a much better way to support their quality of life is through the tax code, is to give them a tax credit, an income payment, in other words, as opposed to a rate design discount. Because if you give them a 35% discount like they're doing in California, they have no incentive to buy efficient equipment. Their price just got lower, their bill just dropped. So why should they be incentivized to engage in conservation when you have dropped the price. So give them an income payment uh, of an equivalent amount and you will see that they will spend some of that income subsidy that's been given to them on the necessities of life, like food, clothing and shelter and not just use it on electricity. Again, it's a longer topic for discussion, but that has been at least my position and the position of many other economists that when you provide, start providing discounts of electric bills, you're not necessarily doing things that are economically efficient for society as a whole. If you do want from a social welfare perspective, social justice perspective, then use the tax code to help them out, not rate design. I think there was another question on why is decarbonization a priority and where is the science to show that that's something useful to do? So I would say, Let's let's re respond to that comment in writing because that could take a long time here. Right, and, 
and I mean, I just wanted to add that point. That's a, that's a very a good question in a sense that the, these are principles that everybody puts weights on. So, you know, you can have five people who say, well, it's, it's not a good thing. It's not a worthwhile goal. And other people will say it is a very worthwhile goal. And I'm going to have all my weight in terms of rate design be based on what it does with respect to decarbonization. So, you know, one of the key things of these principles is it's, it's up to each individual to say, these are the principles that are more important in my view of the world of rate design and electricity make, rate making. And there are differences in what people uh, come out. So us putting that down doesn't necessarily say that we think it's a, an important or not important goal. It's just one of these things that we've seen uh, recently in terms of rate design in other uh, areas. And one comment I can make, and you know, we have seen this in Asia, we have seen this in Canada, we have seen this in the US, decarbonization always comes up. But if you sit down with the two dozen people like this uh, group here, and you ask each one of them to put a weight on each objective, like give them 100 points and do a scorecard, you will find that on some principles, there's a lot of unanimity, and on other principles, there's a lot of divergence. So that's something that has been done in other groups to see how much convergence do we have within the group on these principles and how much divergence do we have on these principles across the group. I mean, that's something that I'm just throwing out there for, for thought, uh, for thinking, and, and we can come back to that concept if there is interest in it. Okay, so uh, I, I believe- well, I Real quick, we, we had a follow-up question. I think Eloisa said, I, I would like to follow up my question. Uh, can you, um, can you, uh, can you say what, what, what the follow-up question is? Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Augie. I, I am not talking about um, the, the, the specific discounts or the way that it was just presented in terms of, um, I, this is what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. There are, I, I'm thinking more about the operational performance, right? So when you think about, I'm going to give you a specific example. Um, my mother's a pastor and she runs a, uh, we used to run a food pantry and would help people pay their bills. So when I would go, I would see the same bills every month, you know, and this was in El Paso, Texas. It was $250 a month, especially in the 100 degree summers. And I could see those bills, one, two, three, it was the same people that were coming and asking for support on those bills month after month. And at that time, I was just in school. I had discovered the kilowatt meter, and I gave her the one that I was given or I had bought for school, and she used that and let people learn about education and the electricity that they were using. And instead of investing, when they would find out that their, their refrigerator was costing them so much over the course of the year, my mother didn't give them anymore the, the 250 per month for three months because she knew that with that funding, she could buy them a refrigerator mm -hmm. that ultimately would save them those costs the long run. So I'm thinking more about the effectiveness of these investments that we are doing in addressing and supporting uh, the, the rate payers um, and, and, and the users of our programs. So, and I'm, I, I welcome the conversation when we start talking about affordability and diving deeper. So I don't want you to think you have to respond, but I wanted you to understand a different perspective in which I was approaching the-, the Actually, you, you have made an incredible point, which is the use of energy efficiency as opposed to rate design to lower the bill. And I personally am a strong proponent of that. Uh, the way to lower your bill is not to switch from rate design A to rate design B. It might change your bill a little bit, but usually no more than 10% or likely 5% is the savings you will see by rate switching. If you really want to lower your bill, you have to invest in energy efficiency. My daughter lives in a condo in San Francisco. Her bill was $40 a month, 700 square foot apartment. She didn't want to pay $40 a month, so she, bought a new refrigerator and her bill dropped to $20. The refrigerator for her was a big end use. She has no air conditioning. San Francisco doesn't need air conditioning. She doesn't have much lighting. Uh, and so then there are plug loads. So in, in, in the example you had, that's exactly what happened too. So we need 
energy efficiency rebates and financing and leasing perhaps to cut people's bill and to address the affordability issue, rate discounts can only go so far. Even that 35% discount they have here is not going to drop their bill by 50% or 75%. I, we, we can have more discussion on that, but I realize it's uh, 7 p.m. your time and we have half an hour to go. I have seen several people asking for the principles to be ranked or a scorecard to be used. We can discuss that offline and get back to you on whether or not that would be something that, uh, you know, that the, the RAC chair and vice chair would like us to pursue along with CPS. We are happy to facilitate it, obviously, if there is interest. Uh, so, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, should I proceed to the next section which deals with rate design? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. All right, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. So uh, this slide is something that we could use if there is interest in doing a scorecard, uh, but let's just file it for now and we'll come back to it. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, smiling faces, right? Okay, let, let's, let's continue. Okay, it looks like some of these slides are from an older deck. Uh, I, I, maybe a mix-up has occurred. Let's see what, what comes out. Here we go. Okay, so uh, well, I'm sorry. This, this is an older deck. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it is, it's not the current deck, but uh, it, it, it might be difficult to switch decks at this point. Uh, should, should I just continue with this? I mean, it's not too different, but it is different from the very last version that we had. Um, I, I know, I, I think there's public comments coming up in 15 minutes, is that correct? Yes, we do that have a public input speaker. Okay, so there's a couple more questions here. I mean, maybe we can continue to answer these questions um, and continue this dialogue. And by that time, we might get to the 15 minutes for the public input. That's fine, go ahead, answer the questions, have people talk more, and okay. then we'll get to the public uh, comments. Yeah. I don't know how many we have signed up. Okay, so uh, let us let me just go up on the questions. Um, yeah, so there, there is one on the economic development rate. I can start on that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. It, that, that is, those are typical. Um, um, and this is where the, uh, where Ahmed first mentioned the incremental marginal cost. Um, because uh, some of these larger customers have the option of, you know, where to locate or to move. Um, there's always a decision about uh, risking and losing those customers if the rates are too high. I mean, in some sense, residential customers are, you know, theoretically are like that too, but not many make their decisions solely on, on electricity uh, rates. Uh, and so the, these are common. And um, the idea is that you know, as long as you are recovering uh, at least the incremental or marginal cost from these customers and keeping them on the system, and so they're paying some amount of the fixed cost, everybody else is, is better off because if you lose them, that means uh, the fixed costs have to be recovered from fewer individuals or fewer customers. Uh, so economic development rates um, are a common uh, type of uh, tariff. Uh, and I guess you can call them a certain type of rate design, but they're more kind of what kind of tariff utilities have. And this is certainly uh, a type that's pretty common in, in many utilities. Yeah, and I, I, I will perhaps provide an example of a very successful uh, economic development tariff um, up in Nova Scotia, Canada. They had a very large pulp and paper mill, which was a 200 megawatt load and they had invested a lot in new electrical processes and then suddenly the digital age dawned and they were not finding much demand for paper. So they uh, were a huge load, supported a lot of jobs. There was a concern they would go out of business or relocate. And so they negotiated with the utility Nova Scotia Power, a special tariff, which was essentially a real time pricing tariff that allowed them to lower their bill sufficiently by shifting load from expensive periods to less expensive periods. And so they stayed in business. Another example, 
So this was like a defensive use of an economic development tariff. And then there is uh, the more assertive use, uh, progressive use, you could call it, uh, in Georgia, where Georgia Power, uh, sometime in the 1990s, decided that they needed to bring more industry and businesses to Georgia by giving them economic development rates. But they couldn't just offer a discount because that would appear to subsidize these customers at the expense of others. So again, they introduced real-time pricing at the margin. If you use more than what you have historically used during the peak hours, you would pay more. And during the off-peak hours, you have an opportunity to lower your bill. And so they now have more than 2,000 customers on that economic development rate, which is real-time pricing. There's no cross-subsidy. Those customers are paying their cost, but they have an incentive to modify their load shape and by, by so doing to lower their bills. And they have attracted customers from around the US to Georgia, even customers from overseas, including from Japan, for example. So economic development rates typically used for larger customers who are in a position to move around, uh, relocate, uh, et cetera. And the very, uh, sometimes it can generate controversy, but if you show that there is no cross subsidy, then usually the commissions or the boards will improve upon that. I think there is a question that just popped up about uh, Eloisa's example. And, and I, I guess the question, how do we re-energize or renew the current rebate programs already in place, like insulation appliances, et cetera? And are we missing out by not engaging folks and creating a high utilization of the already existing program? That's a good question. I think it's a question best addressed by CPS because we are not plugged into the energy conservation. Program. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, Ahmad, this is Rudy. Uh, I would say that um, we have really tried hard over the 10 years of STEP to change our programs up. You know, STEP was, you know, began to really change behaviors. And, and I think, it, you know, by and large, we've, we've you know, our, our, our customers have responded well. Um, there's and so there's some programs obviously that have, have higher utilization rates and higher efficiency of you know of, of uh, success than than others. Uh, I do think that um, Eloisa's example is a good one. We're in the middle right now of um, you know crafting the, the what we're calling our flex step uh, program. We have not presented that to the board or council yet. Uh, we will uh, between now and the end of the year, uh, but those are certainly programs um, that um, present opportunities for us. So, you know, I, the question that becomes, you know, how, you know, how you know, I don't know what a refrigerator costs these days, but you know, it, let's just say it's you know 500 bucks. You know, at 500 bucks, how many of those can we do and still do weatherization and you know solar rebates and some of the other things that are really popular programs that that have benefited our, our customers over the years. So it's just a matter of capacity, uh, but but certainly a, uh, a very, very good suggestion that uh, we will take into account as we craft a new uh, proposal for council and, and the board to consider. Uh, Rudy, this read, let me just jump in here. This will be an issue that we will be dealing with after we get through this educational period. We will look at the flex step program so we'll have plenty of time to discuss the effectiveness or of, the, of each of those uh, programs. And uh, as I understand right now, Rudy, we're kind of on a intermediate or interim program, uh, but we've been on this now for two years. Is that right? Yes, sir. We, uh, you know, just the pandemic had an impact on us getting uh, through what we're, we called it. We, we, we named it the step bridge. Uh, but we're we're uh, you know we're we're going to have to do something between now and next July uh, to get some new programs in place. Uh, council gave us time, uh, recognizing the challenges of uh, of the of the pandemic. So, uh, but we are on a really good timeline to 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 get that uh, for consideration. And certainly, uh, we will be happy to bring uh, the same presentation that ultimately the board and council will see to the rack 
So you can give us your, your opinion. Yeah, that, that's yeah, not a problem. Yeah, Rudy, we'll need a little bit more than presentation because we're going to have to look at the cost of this because actually this becomes part of the, the cost buildup. It isn't free. You know, it has to be collected in the right and used uh, appropriately. So uh, I think we will yes, be spending some time on that. Yes, sir. And it's certainly our customers pay the bill. So you, you're absolutely right. All right. Uh, there is another question or comment, I should say, which is a very important one uh, from Anne Marie. Complicated rate designs must also take into consideration the resources it would take to assign, track, and process a proliferation of tiers. And I guess perhaps tiers is being used here in the broad sense to include time of use periods and, and other concepts as well. Or I'll take the liberty of interpreting it that way. Uh, it is true that for a utility that has primarily had simpler rates as it thinks of moving to more complex rates, either time of use rates or rates with demand charges or subscription plans or dynamic pricing like real-time pricing, those are more complex from a, not just a metering perspective but also a billing perspective. But ultimately, they're more complex from a customer service perspective. And so more resources are needed to train the staff who will be interacting with customers. More resources are needed to create a better website and a more fulfilling experience, et cetera, et cetera. And so ultimately there is a trade-off between how much you will gain from having more complex rates versus how much you would lose in terms of expenses as well as confusion. But let me give you one example and we'll get more into this, uh, I think in the next RAC meeting. Oklahoma Gas and Electric, uh, not too far away from where you guys are, relative to from California or the East Coast, OG&E as they're called, they have a very sophisticated dynamic pricing program for their residential customers. It is called Smart Hours. And what they have done is they have said, we have some real peaking issues on certain days when it becomes very expensive to provide power to customers. So we're going to encourage them to use less on those expensive periods of time. And they have divided those expensive days into four levels of expense. They have given each customer a smart thermostat and they have allowed each customer to program the smart thermostat to respond accordingly. So if your normal setting, let's say 72 degrees and level one comes in, you can tell the thermostat to rise to 73 degrees or 74, et cetera, et cetera. Each customer has their own lifestyle, their own priorities. They do their own programming. And then the price signal comes in automatically into the thermostat, which the customer has already programmed to respond to it. So they don't have to be thinking about it all the time. They have one out of five customers signed on to that program, 20%. And they have analyzed the data to see what impact has that had on their peak load during those expensive periods, it drops by 20%. And the average customer is saving upwards of 20% on their monthly bill. And, and we can provide the details later on when we get into those slides. But there are examples of successful complex rates working out. But not every utility wants to do what OG&E has done. Most of them, like in Colorado, like in Michigan, like in California, are just moving ahead with simple time of use rates, but for all of their customers. Maryland is looking into it as well. They're doing some pilots. Nova Scotia just approved some pilots. And in the state of Washington, Puget Sound Energy is going to go down that same pathway. So if there is hesitation because there's complexity, then one way to deal with it is to do a pilot. And with that, what I'm going to do is um, perhaps uh, turn it over back to the chair and um, let, uh, uh, I, I guess, perhaps uh, uh, read. You can yep. tell us uh, what you yep. want to do. Uh, we got it. Uh, I guess now we need to uh, see who we've got uh, signed up. And uh, Anna, if you can help us with that, uh, see if we have speakers uh, that like to speak. Yes, sir. We have one speaker that has signed up. It's Dr. Meredith McGuire. And Adrian, if you will unmute her and she can speak. Thank you. 
Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Anne. Dr. Meredith McGuire, I'm going to unmute you now to provide your public comment. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, okay, thanks. Um, I'm glad that I listened to this whole thing so far because I've changed what I wanted to say. I do apologize for the fact that it isn't as smooth as it was going to be, but I think that I can address some of the issues. Uh, I'm a retired professor of sociology and anthropology at Trinity University, and I've continued working with three Trinity colleagues to try to understand the affordability problems of the poorest 40% of households in this city. Uh, one of my colleagues discovered that CPS energy bills and SAWS bills uh, drive a large number of uh, customers to the clutches of the um, the lenders of the the uh, what do you call it uh, the uh, the the um, very unaffordable. Uh, uh, um, lenders that have you re, re, uh, restart your uh, program over and over and over again, getting uh, terrible rates of, of um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, anyhow, I want to move on to the affordability thing and, and remind, I'm sorry, Credit, what? Credit cards? Uh, no, it's not credit cards, it's the, uh, the uh, payday loan. Uh, programs. I'm sorry. <laughs> the payday loan pro, uh, plans are really, really uh, widespread in San Antonio because there are so many people that literally cannot afford their bills. And and once they're in the clutches of these payday lenders, they frequently end up losing homes due to the, the lending. Um, so uh, we're really concerned about the high proportion of people in this city right now, uh, be partly because of the um, the COVID uh, shutdown. Uh, we're looking at tens of thousands of families that are uh, at risk of having their power and their water cut off. And once that's done, then their uh, landlords can evict them or they might lose their homes because of these uh, high, high, high bills. Uh, one of, I can't remember which of the speakers, but um, one of the um, speakers from um, Brattle was uh, talking about ter uh, turning to taxes to pay for uh, these uh, issues. But the fact of the matter is that Texas has so few uh, taxes and the cities have so little say in what share of those taxes uh, they can get that uh, we as a city are desperate for tax money. So we can't have that be the way by which we handle the things like the uh, affordability problems, uh, affordability discounts, or the, uh, for that matter, the uh, promotion of energy efficiency. So uh, I think that we really have to look at the ways by which um, the energy efficiency promotion and the conservation measures that are so important to having really good um, rates for San Antonio. And I might add that uh, Reed Williams is one of the examples of somebody who has emphasized energy efficiency uh, for uh, rates since, oh gee, since I first uh, heard about what, she, what he was doing at CPS with regard to the nuclear power plant. Um, so any Thank I'm you, sorry. Go ahead. Turn, turn her back on. Let her finish. Thank you, Reed. Um, I'm going to send all of you uh, uh, copies of a study that the Sierra Club paid for uh, to evaluate the energy efficiency programs uh, that are involved in the Flex Step, because although they are programs that that are working in some ways, they are not accomplishing anywhere near as much as they could uh, if they were done better. And we uh, at the Sierra Club have been pushing them for uh, 18 months since that study was revealed to start talking about how those kinds of 
measures would be accomplished. And I think that it's really important that the committee takes a look at that uh, uh, study because it, it was done by a, a very reputable outside agency. And um, these, these are the kinds of energy and conservation programs we need badly because that's the only way that we're going to be able to help those low income households get the energy they need and at the same time have them not using so much energy. Uh, we need right now some of that weatherization before the next heat wave hits because there are dozens of families that have housing that is so, um, so energy inefficient and so unprotective from the heat that we're going to lose lives. Already San Antonio has had several deaths due to um, fear of turning on the air conditioner because they couldn't afford the bill. So we need that help now. And I just really urge not only for this committee, but for CPS Energy to put some effort and thought into speeding up the StepFlex program, beefing it up considerably. And you don't have to do that by tacking the bills on to all of the rate payers. The residential rate payers sh um, should be having some protection from uh, being charged for the, the flex step program because only the, the people that are using too much energy should be paying for those promotions for the, from the bottom of. That's the reason why Austin has so much lower uh, usage rates is that there's a lot of promotion there for uh, energy efficiency and conservation, even outside of the kinds of uh, tag on rates um, that they that uh, San Antonio uses. So I'm sorry I'm so unarticulate um, about this, but the reality is that I was very glad to have heard some of these uh, issues or questions raised. So thank you very much for the chance to speak now. Thank you, Dr. McGuire. And I can assure you that, uh, as you can see from the discussions today, that um, looking at it, at ways of increasing the energy efficiency and saving all customers uh, money will be very important to this group. At that time, if we have no other uh, individuals to speak, um, and I will at this time, uh, and Anne, do you have anything else? No, no, sir. She was our only speaker. Thank you. Okay. Eloisa, do you have anything before we close? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you for everyone today. Yes. Thank okay. you, Dr. Thank McGuire. you all very much. Ahmad, I really appreciate the presentation. Uh, we have uh, delayed so that everybody won. Well, no, we delayed this ranking thing because I think we need to get a little bit better understanding on rates before we start bringing our biases to our uh, calculations here and, and ranking these things. So uh, you can blame me for putting off the, uh, the ranking, and, but we will get to it at the appropriate time. If we have nothing else, then I thank you all very much and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll follow up on the questions that we couldn't get to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick.